So today we are going to talk about uh, Zpark IO. Uh, first, before we start, I'd like to try a little social experiment. Um, I have uh, the special chat open and I have Discord open so I can follow along on the chat. Can everybody do a little like uh, hello on the on the special chat, like a little uh, thumbs up if you can hear me? I know there is a delay between the two, but that can be fun to see. No, oh, nobody. There you go. I see people on this call. Okay, cool. Everybody is following along. Awesome. All right. So if you have a question, don't hesitate to stop me and um, don't hesitate to uh, to do like little uh, emoticons on uh, on special chat. Let's let's do like a rock and roll uh, rock and roll band. <laughs> so my name is Leo Bankel. Um, I used to work as a data engineer. I am now creating my own company. Uh, you can follow me on uh, on LinkedIn if you want to follow along. Uh, you can also follow me on Discord. My username is always Leo Bankel. Uh, I'm passionate about Scala, data, functional programming, and helping others. Um, you can see, see uh, these aspects throughout my different projects. Uh, you might have heard me talk before about the Park at other conferences, and I'm here to, to show you uh, the progress uh, that we've made. And uh, I also uh, created the SBT plugin called Soteria, which helps you um, protect your project against vulnerabilities and uh, enforcing good practices. I am also the author of Two of Scala, and I also manage a Scala learning community with like 200 people learning Scala together. Um, I'm going to give you a few seconds to take a screenshot if you'd like. All right. Um, the next um, the next part, I mean, we're gonna talk about Spark. Most of you might already know what that is, but uh, I just want to make sure everybody is on the same page. So we have um, Spark is a distributed computing framework. Uh, the main AP, there is like three API: Data Frame, Data Set, and RDD. Data Frame is actually under the Data Set API, but uh, the main one is data set of A, which um, we use a lot of functional programming methods like map, flat map, filters. So it's really not a stretch to go from, you know, Scala functional programming to Spark. The language is pretty similar. What's necessary to understand as well is that the Spark cluster is composed of, of one driver and several executors. The executors receive the jobs to do and the computation to perform from the drivers. And when the job is complete, the executors uh, return the results. The operation are what I call, I don't know, semi-lazy because some methods like the map, the flat map are lazy, but some other are not lazy and materialize the data. So you need to get kind of like a used to like what you're doing because you might materialize data when you don't want to or vice versa. You might think that the operation is, is completed, but you haven't materialized it. And it's step-by-step uh, -by, -step by default. Uh, so what's the use case for Spark? Uh, it's ETL pipeline. So you basically load the data, transform them, aggregate, and probably save them somewhere. So that would be uh, what we call like a map reduce. You transform the data and then you reduce it. You might you know, compute numbers or averages or whatnot. And when you think about the transformations that you are uh, creating when you write your Spark application, you pretty much have one or more sources that you read, and then you transform them to have the right data type that you need. Then you will merge them and to do your aggregation, and you will probably save them into one or more places. Maybe, for instance, you can write a table to Postgres and also save like a CSV to S3, why not? And when you see this, this graph of operation, you realize that those blocks here could be run in parallel, like the top ones, the, the left part of the top square and the right part of the top square are not interacting up to the point where they merge. So there's no reason to wait for them to be, to be completed in, in any specific order. So let's talk about the asynchronous part of Scala right now, futures. And more specifically, I just want to to thank and give credits where it's due, um, I got this revelation, quote unquote, at the Spark Summit 2019 with this talk parallelizing with Apache Spark in unexpected ways from uh, Anna Holchuk. 
And she presented in this talk the concept that we could parallelize step in Spark. So she illustrated her speech with this example and the little yellow boxes here. You can see that those operations are not dependent and there is no reason for them to be in parallel, to be sequential. So they could be parallelized. Um, so in the next slide, she show how you can wrap those in futures and then run the futures at the same time. And in the Spark UI, you see that the tasks are uh, stack on top of each other instead of being sequ sequential. So I shortened the operation, of course. Like there were several slides when they were one after another, and then after writing in futures, you see this st uh, parallelized one. So I was super excited. As soon as I got home from the conference, I tried on one of my projects. It used to take 40 minutes, and now it takes 20 because all the sources are fetched in parallel. So in, when you launch the Postgres query, you don't have to wait for it to return. You can already launch the next one. And then when you get all your data, you can do your aggregation operation. Um, but there are a lot of issues with futures. For instance, you can't cancel them. And if you want to get out of the future framework, you have to call await.result and wait for it. But you, it's required to give it a, a time. And you, you might give it like an infinite time. But then if it hang, you're, you're dead in water. Or if you put a short time and it dies before it stops, the future actually is not canceled. So it will continue in the background. And if you want to catch the failure and be like, oh, it timed out, so I'm going to retry. But if, I don't know, you're doing some insert and you're inserting some rows, and then you try to retry by deleting all the rows you inserted to make sure it's clean, and then you insert more rows. If the previous one have not stopped, then it's, it's a mess. So it's really hard. It's also really hard to implement a retry for a future, because as soon as you create it, it starts. So it's not very straightforward. Um, if you want to learn more about futures, um, you can go on the tour of Scala. There is a little article on it. And now let's introduce the IO. I mean, introduce. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows about it right now. Uh, but uh, it's basically a framework to wrap sync and asynchronous operation. But there's a lot more to it. Um, and you can map. Uh, you can map across uh, anything at like. Uh, at, you can describe the operation you want to perform on a higher layer than Spark does. Like Spark will do the, the actual transformation, but with the IO, you can orchestrate how all of that happened. Um, you can describe your application as like a network of tasks. Hopefully, your Spark application is not that complicated, but <laughs> uh, it, it kind of like remind you of this part, right? So you have like all those steps that connects and 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 end is like a start and an end on the on the graph of operations um, to me i see uh the io kind of like as this uh, graph of operation which uh is pushing all the side effects like the interaction with the environment like s3 connections or postgres connections or file io to the edge of your program and the advantage of doing that do it that way then you can fuel it like i kind of like see it as like you know a vascular system and you have all those pipes and you can inject any kind of uh world into it so you can insert your real world with your postgres connection and everything but you can also insert your fake ones when you perform unit tests for instance just so everybody's on the same page you've seen this one before you have the environment which has a requirement to, put, to perform these tasks the errors and the output in case of success um, so the advantage of the IO over futures when it comes to wrapping Spark into something is that you, um, you can wrap both what you want to parallelize and what you don't want to parallelize. So you have this one framework. You don't have to do an await and kind of like jump in and out of the future framework. You can always be in the ZIO one. And when you decide to start something asynchronously, you just call dot .fork and it's in parallel. Uh, there's also advantage that you can cancel. So if, if something fail or if you don't perform on time, you can stop it. So it's also easy retry. We're going to see uh, in a few slides, like you can just call dot retries and you have a retry all, all, all good to go. You also have timeout. So you can be like, okay, if it's taking too long, I'm going to stop and maybe something's going wrong. And um, because you can push things in the environment, you don't have to pass your uh, database connection everywhere, or you don't have to pass your Spark session everywhere. Uh, if you are used to um, to working with Spark, you know that you 
most often have like either an implicit spoxation or you have a spoxation as the first argument of pretty much every single one of your methods. But with the IO, you push that in the environment and you don't have it anymore. So now let's dive into how uh, the two ID from Spark and the IO are, are merged together. If you want to uh, follow along, um, you can look on the um, GitHub repo, and there's also a dedicated channel on the ZIO uh, Discord server. I would like to thank my dad for the logo as well, um, and it was nice of him to help me with that. So what is uh, Zipark IO? The goal is to build this functional framework, not replacing Spark, but kind of wrapping it. It's kind of like a little uh, easier to swallow pill, you know, like you wrap everything in like a, a nice little uh, a nice little envelope, so it's easier to manage. It's kind of like adding extra levers to, uh, to do a little, um, like, I don't know, like a, a common center for your, for your Spark operation. And so the goal of the IO is to add a lot of helper function of Zipark IO is to add a lot of helper function to make the code uh, smoother and easier to read, easier to use. Uh, it also uh, helps you implement retries and timeouts, as I said earlier, and it allows you to parallelize task. Um, if you want to dive deeper, there are examples in the repo with like a kind of a simple uh, boilerplate and a little bit more advanced one. There's also an article from my friend Ayub Fakir on how to migrate from your plain Spark application to your uh, Zipark IO application. What does a Zipark IO application look like? Well, in theory, it should just look like that. <laughs> well, let's dive a little bit deeper than that to scratch the surface, but you will dive, uh, oh, and the goal of having this, having your application as a trait, is that you can basically run your entire application from end to end as a unit test. Because you can fuel it with anything you want. You can fix the database, you can fix the file IO, you can fix the S3 connections. And it would be really hard to do that with a classic Spark application because you would have to modify everything everywhere. Usually Spark application have a lot of, of side effects, like you would read something, write something, and but with the IO, you push everything into one nice little package you can replace. So you were able to run the entire application as a unit test, which is amazing. And Zipark, uh, Zipark IO provide um, helpers function for your unit test, which um, we're going to see a little bit later. Um, so the application we saw earlier basically implement this zparkio app trait that takes several arguments which allow it to construct this boilerplate for you and also have everything typed so when you have to implement each of the function you are guided by the compiler the first one is the command line input class so you saw earlier here that you have some dash dash blah 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 and that is usually very useful when you i don't know have to run you know your um Spark project for some specific, I don't know, user ID or something, and you can push them, push that to them. It used to be relying on the scalp library, which I love, but a lot of uh, people uh, told me that it would be pretty cool if it was available to, to have any kind of command line library. So that has been split up in half. So now there is a zparkio classic core, and you can attach the zio scalp uh, library, if you'd like to use Scallop, or you can implement your own. And I was thinking, for instance, if someone want to volunteer to combine it with the ZIO config library, that would be amazing. There's also the environment. That's where you will put uh, everything that your application need on the on the higher higher level. So, for instance, if you need like a database connection, uh, S3 connection, all of these will be put in this bundle. And the output, which usually will be a unit, but I exposed it because Sometimes you might want to have your Spark little thing, you know, return something if it's in a higher architecture. So uh, usually it's unit, but the option is there. So it's actually pretty um, ironical because up until recently, a few, like totally like a few weeks ago, I was talking about Zipark IO as like a boilerplate to help you combine ZIO and Spark, but to be fair, there were a lot of things you had to implement yourself. So it was like a 
I was just re replacing one ball played by another one. But um, now we have Gitter 8, which allow you to do one line SBT new with the Zipark.io uh, Gitter 8. And it will ask you a few questions, um, like the name of your project, the organization that will create a package name for you. Then the SBT version, by default, it will take the latest one. The Scala version, I would love to take the latest one, but Spark is not uh, supporting it quite yet. So you can put the versions that are adequate for your project. Uh, you have Scala test already included. You have Scala FMT already included. You have Scala style already included. Then it asks about the ZPARCAIO um, versions and the Spark versions. Um, the project versions that will be the, the version of your project. So usually if you start from scratch to be a, whatever is the first one. And then if you want to have a scale up version on it, by default, it's no, I usually, I, I, I like um, scale up. So I, I like using it and that will generate your project for you with the Git in your, the, the Scala FMT with a default um, styling guide. You can modify it if you'd like, but there's default uh, and this project can run right away. It is like pre implementation for everything. And you can replace what's ex what are showing you as examples by your own uh, use case. And it's not showed here, but uh, there's also a basic unit test being created. So you really have everything done for you and you can customize rather than um, write everything from scratch every time. So what's left to do, uh, just implement this one function. And you see it, it already pre-combine and pre-create all the types for you. So you just have this one function to implement. The complete environment is basically the environment provided by Zipark.io, which contain your Spark station and all the other tools, the logger. And it's add all, it add your own environment that you described with your database and your S3 connection, like we talked about earlier. And um, and you, the output type here, it says string because um, it's a typo, but that will be your output type. Uh, we talked about earlier, that will be unit most of the time. Okay, but so we still haven't really talked about what you get with zipark.io. So, so now after typing this gitter head command, we have a project ready to go. So why would we want to use zipark.io over just world spark? Well, what I was saying earlier, for instance, you have access to Spark from anywhere. You don't have to um, pass it as the argument of your function, or you don't have to use implicit val and, and, and yeah, you can get it from anywhere. You just do a Spark modules that will, there is like a function, you know, an apply functions that extract it from the ZIO environment and you get your Spark station. And that's all created by uh, Zipark. Um, what else? You also, uh, can use Spark within like a little context. And for instance, you can create uh, like your fetch function. In the future, you can look at the repo. There is like a lot of issues related to that building more helper functions. So that would be nice to have all that built in. You just basically, I don't know, you could have like Spark module done fetch S3 and you just pass, give the pass. Um, and you can also see that there is a shortcut type like ZDS, which is like ZIO dataset, which is a ZIO return type, which include basically all, all the dip, all the environment, which will be Spark and all the things, plus the Strayable return type because Spark, you know, Spark fails, so you want to have the Strayable, <laughs> and the return type that you pass, which but the return type of ZDS here it's. A, it's a book because you, you don't even have to think that it's, it's basically a data set wrapped in a ZIO, but the type is much easier to read that way. Um, another improvement that is on the roadmap is to be able to get rid of all the import implicit because we kind of want to do, you know, the rails of Spark. Like uh, it's, every, it's opinionate, opinionated configuration. So you would, force the use of data set. So you know that everything is a case class. So you can basically create the Spark implicit each time for the user. So you don't have to pass it everywhere. It's not done yet. It's on the roadmap. But so now that's kind of like, the, there's nothing improved here compared to a raw Spark, other than, you know, the error messages will be bubble up and everything. But what you can do now is that you have your ZIO of your, of your Spark 
uh, object is that you can call retries on it and you can call timeout on it because the IO give it to you for free. So uh, let's read what that does here. And, and I will just let you imagine what you would have to do to do that with raw spark or to do that with futures. Uh, I don't even want to think about it. But basically you do like a retry forever with a weight in between each retry, which is exponential and start at 200 milliseconds. And overall, it can't take more than five minutes. So I don't know if someone wants to uh, write a little snippet of code in Discord with, uh, with how you do that with raw spark or how you do that with uh, futures, uh, that, would be, that would be fun. <laughs> yeah, I saw there were like a challenge earlier, we can have another one. Um, and then how do you fetch things in parallel? Well, you can just call fork and then you can call fork at the beginning of your application, you know, and while you prepare all the things, the queries are running. And then when you need them, you just call the join and you have your queries and you can do your join and you're done and happy. And the fetch already include all the previous uh, uh, requirement with the timeout, with the retry, and all of that will happen at, in the background. And um, then you basically end up with, with this structure where things run in parallel. Um, what else is there? You can also create a data set. And so that will basically call the parallelize or the 2DS um, uh, API and create a data set for you. That's pretty useful for unit tests. You know, if you override the, if you override the, the I'm having a, a brain issue. <laughs> so that's pretty useful in unit tests if you override your sources. So instead of run, reading from a data set or a, a database, you will, you know, have your fetch user becoming this and you can do all your, your, your application in as a unit test. And uh, there is no need to do implicit or anything because it's, uh, it's a case class and we know it's a case class. Um, you can also do broadcast. So you have a wrapper around the broadcast where you can um, you can just create your broadcast in a simple line. You don't have to do any fancy things. Uh, if you've used DIO, you know that the uh, error stack trace is incredible. So for the people who don't know, uh, you basically get the error message, the exception, of course, but you also get where it has been before, like what was the previous task that triggered this particular one that failed. Uh, remember the graph connection of all the operation, you will basically uh, have this list of what I've run in the past. And that's cool too, but what's even better is that you also have the stack trace of what will have run if it will have succeed. So you know exactly like what I've not run yet, what I failed and what has succeed. And it's pretty useful in the context of Spark because that can give you clues or exactly what, what went wrong or what you know you might have already pushed as side effect. Maybe you already wrote some file and so you, you might want to consider what have succeeded before we try. Uh, and you also have a helper library to run unit tests that is a wrapper around the awesome, uh, awesome Spark test library. So that allow you to create a local Spark while you run a unit test and it handles all the new session and reset of the environment, everything. And so you can, but that's how you can run your, your application as a unit test. There is also, uh, if you're in the middle of this transition period and you already have experimented with futures, like I've had, um, that was pretty useful to have some conversion um, utilities to be able to go from future to ZIO. And so that will convert uh, everything to uh, the, the right type for Zpark IO. Okay, so um, I just want to point out a few things that have changed between the previous talk and this talk because there were a lot that has been done. Um, so we reorganized the, the architecture of the repo. We put all the example in one place. We put all the tests in one place. So it's a bit less messy. There's a bit less um, things in the root. Uh, previously, there were like a lot of lay, like files hanging around everywhere and, and folders everywhere. So they were a little uh, spring cleaning or like a quarantine cleaning. And we also split up um, the park IO from Scallop. So now you can add Scallop on if you need to. And the Gitterhead supported, so you can just turn it on if you want to. 
Um, it built for several Spark version. At the beginning, it was kind of like my, my little side project. So it was only built for the one I used, but now that it's uh, more widely used, uh, it built for the latest 2.3 and the latest 2.4, and it's pretty straightforward to add new versions. So that should be uh, cool to see people adding new versions. And the Gitterhead template, which makes using it incredible. So, okay, that's a lot of talk, but um, what about results? Well, I had this other project and I tried to move it from uh, future to the IO and we gain like uh, an hour on, on fetching data and doing parallelization of tasks and computations. So it's a pretty massive improvement so in terms of like time, but also it's faster to test because you can test faster. It's also less money because if you um, if you have to uh, uh, just on the raw cost of the cluster, but also because you're using the IO and remember you have the retry and the timeout, which means the failure rate is also lower, which means you will spend less time overall because let's say your first version fail after two hours, you have to retry the entire three hours. So overall it will take five. But with, uh, with the Zipark IO system and the retry built in, you um, you you reduce the rate of failures. You also uh, can leverage the timeout system, which means that you don't uh, waste time. Like, for instance, if your I don't know whatever third party system you're calling is hanging, you can put limitation on that. It's like, okay, I've, I've waited for ten minutes. The service is dead. We we can kill the cluster. Otherwise, you might wait. You know, for like. I don't know, like three days and be like, oh, damn it, the cluster is blocked. So how far can you push it? Well, pretty far. You can parallelize a lot. Um, I just want to point out that it only works if you do a, lit a lot of little operations. Uh, for instance, if you if you do one big computation that leverage the entire cluster, well, you can't, you know, obviously, it's like we're still in the real world. You can't add more resources. But it's very useful when, I don't know, you want to do like a loop that does like some computation for each of the user, or maybe you do like some specific queries and you have like, I don't know, like a table per user, I, I don't know. Like, you know, you will do like an operation that maybe part of the cluster only is needed. Like you might use two executors and then you have the entire cluster just waiting for the two to be done and then two other executors will do something else. Well, like that, you can leverage 100% of your cluster, 100% of the time. What's next? Well, there's a list of issues. I would love for uh, people to come help and contribute. Um, that would be awesome to have more helper functions. That would be awesome to have more handler for different config libraries. Like I said earlier with ZIO uh, config, that would be great. And there are also common line libraries. Uh, if someone um, is using one, we can add that as well. Uh, where to find it. So you can go to the GitHub, uh, GitHub page. You can also join the ZIO Discord. There is, um, there is one specific channel for, for Zipark IO. So in conclusion, if you want to uh, power up your Spark, you uh, can use Zipark IO. You're gonna have a fully lazy um, graph of operation. You're going to have better error handling. You're going to have built-in retry, built-in timeout, built-in parallelization, easier to test, easier to set up. So what, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Any questions?